Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Sports talk where your voice counts. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motors studio, here's Steve Jones. Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury, Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. We've got another winner for you on tap today. All right. The top 50 all time, uh, top 50 this year, most valuable franchises out. We ran it down the other day. Well, Kurt Badenhausen from Forbes will join us at 335. Blair Thomas will join us at 406. Ben Jones at 435 today. So we'll talk about the value of franchises, which I think people are intrigued with at 335. We'll talk to one of the all-time Penn State greats at 406, and then we'll talk about current Penn State football with Ben Jones of statecollege.com in the final half hour of the show today. So a lot going on. We'll have some fun with it today. And uh, what do the Phillies do now? Phillies are in an interesting spot about the trade deadline and how important that the trade deadline is going to be to them as to how they handle it. That includes maybe not trading anybody. That's, believe it it or not, sometimes when you do nothing, you're doing something. And I know, for example, our digital media staff has been trying to say that for years. Is that wrong, Sean? Their battle cry, their mantra, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Sometimes when we're doing nothing, we're doing something. <laughs> right? Speaks, now, speaks volumes, yes. I, I think it's a statement unto itself. I also know for a fact that they're dealing with a really smart guy in Roger who knows darn well <laughs> what it means. <laughs> That's the difference. <laughs> Uh-oh, the management guy's a smart guy. I don't think this is going to work. Jig is up. <laughs> I don't think this is going to work. It's all, all. a muse. <laughs> it's all a ruse. <laughs> so what do the Phillies need to do here now? You know, it's interesting. Uh, for uh, they, The odd thing is the Phillies very rarely have handled this part well over the years. Have you noticed that, Sean? Well, that's what really makes this uh, series with the Braves so vital this weekend. They can not only gain some ground on the Braves, and for sure, well, they're not going to definitely solidify a wild card slot this weekend, but they'll be in better shape to uh, possibly achieve that by the end of September. But Well, D- David Murphy in the Inquirer says, uh, after a string of misfires, the Phillies can't afford to get their next big move wrong. And, you know, they... They're talking about what the front office needs to do. Um, now, they're talking about when they dealt for Charlie Morton, who, by the way, has been spectacular since he left Philadelphia. Um, and then, of course, they get Morton, and he ends up blowing out his hamstring. That's the example he uses. And, you know, the reason the Pirates made the move was they knew they had Jamison Tyone, who was about ready to be a part of the Pirates franchise. So they felt they could trade Morton, and Morton was 31. Now, it turns out Morton goes to Houston. Morton ends up being great in Houston. He actually is really good for Tampa Bay right now, as fate would have it. But they've got to do a good job with this. And you're right. I think, Sean, I think you hit the nail right in the head. The Phillies, first of all, need to do something against Atlanta to then tell management where they are. That's what they have to do. Is they have to say, okay, this is where we are. Okay? We, we were able to go out and do the job against Atlanta. Great. Say they do that. 
Now it will tell the front office exactly what they have to do. Now let's go for it. We're right on the, you know, we're climbing back in. We're going to get on their heels. Or if they did what they did when they went to SunTrust Park a few weeks ago, then the bottom line is going to be, um, maybe we should just do nothing here and leave it at that. It's interesting because the Phillies' attendance is up and that their TV ratings are up. The radio ratings are up because, look, the, the team's better. It's not just this weekend. I think the whole upcoming nine-game homestand is going to tell the tale. Really, not just, but obviously well, this weekend with the Braves. But well, I mean, look, the the trade deadline is a week from today. The team's going to do or, what they I'm do. Sorry, it's a it's a week from what? It's six days away. I apologize. Yeah, so I didn't mean Wednesday. To cut you off I mean, the team has to do the best they can do, and then yeah, then at that point, then uh, then Ball be in Madden upper management's uh, court to see what they'll do. <sighs> Boy, it really is a. Uh, and if they do anything, that's the key. You know, they they got to connect on something. Like you may mention there with Charlie Morton, and and granted, there's other teams around the league. I mean, they you know upper management they swing and miss too. Oh, I mean, it's definitely well, not an exact science. Well, again, it's got to be the right fit. And I mean, the Red Sox got Cashner from the. Uh, Orioles. He's done nothing with Boston. After actually pitching pretty well with Baltimore, sometimes you know, and that's part of the, that's part of it too. There's certain guys, for example, that hey, they're terrific one place where there's no pressure, and then they get to the pressure cooker. Hey, and the pressure, and there are certain markets that are pressure cookers. Philadelphia is a pressure cooker market. Okay. Like, Charlie Morton goes from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia, right? Okay. Well, guess what? Pittsburgh is not a pressure cooker market. Hey, like I pointed out before the All-Star break, the Pirates were one game under the All-Star break. I said, now, what's the difference between the Pirates organization and fan base compared to Philadelphia, Boston, whatever? Philadelphia and Boston are both were both above 500 at the All Star break, and their fans were disgusted. The Pirates were a game under. Like, golly gee, Willikers, look how great we're doing. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. The pressure cooker. There's no pressure in Pittsburgh. There's pressure in Philadelphia. There's pressure in Boston. Just like in college football, there's pressure at Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State. That's where the pressure is. Do you think there's pressure? I mean, in all honesty, you really think there's deep seated pressure at Rutgers? No offense, you know, I mean, but, I mean, do you think if Rutgers accomplishes something, they're hugging the guy. Penn State wins nine games in 2018, and and people are like, what the heck's going on here? Okay. Rutgers wins nine games. I mean, they're, they're setting up a parade. It's just there are certain places that... Uh, I'll give you a couple guys. Kevin Brown, Ed Whitson. They both were very good pitchers other places. Brown with the Marlins, Whitson with the Padres. They both went to New York, and guess what happened in New York? The pre- they couldn't take the pressure. Even though they had a better team around them, they couldn't take the pressure. Just couldn't do it. Some guys can't. Some guys just thrive when they're the big fish in a small pond. So what? Yeah. You know, then they then suddenly get to, to the big pond with the big expectations, and like, uh, you mean you guys are going to notice everything I'm doing? Drew Pomerantz. I mean, then you have other people when they get the opportunity to get to the big stage. Whoa, you know, right? They thrive in it. Yeah, 
That's a big difference. Some guys just have a different makeup, and they're they're just you know they're in a spot where yeah people aren't happy, the record isn't great, but they're doing fine. Then all of a sudden, when the expectations get ratcheted up, and guess what? There's a value on every at bat. There's a value on every drop back pass. There's a value on every single shot from the outside, where it's not just another game. Uh, it's a little bit different. A little bit different. All right. We'll take a break. Come back with more in a moment. Thanks for joining us today. Brought to you by Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors, Key Routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf on News Radio 1070, WKOK. When it comes to car buying, there's the other guy's way, and then there's the SMC way. The other guys force you into a vehicle you really don't want. The Sunbury Motors way lets you take the time you need to browse, ask questions, and take the test drive and think on it. For over 100 years, the Mertz family and all their employees have made your experience the most pleasant one you'll ever have. The other guys won't offer you the best price for your trade, no matter how much they say they will. The SMC way is their promise to provide you with the most money the market shows your vehicle is worth. The SMC way is to offer you all applications applicable factory rebates on new vehicles and generous discounts. Looking for a pre-owned vehicle? The SMC Way checks each vehicle in a 200-mile radius to determine the lowest price, then beat it. It's the lowest price promise, just part of the SMC Way. The choice is up to you. The other guy's way or the SMC Way. The SMC Way wins every time. Sunbury Motors Company in the North 4th Street Auto Plaza, Sunbury, and at sunburymotors.com. Selling more cars and satisfying more customers for over 100 years. Did you see that the Pac-12 may play noon games this year? And I mean noon Eastern time. You know what that means, don't you, Sean? Not to be confused with breakfast at Wimbledon, breakfast with the Pac-12. Kickoff at 9.05 Pacific. (laughs) Okay, now Fox, is, and I pointed this out, so this is not... This is this should not be foreign to those who listen to the show regularly. That Fox has looked at the last couple of years of data, and they feel that their higher-rated games, you know, and that includes Michigan, Ohio State, but even when you take that out of there, their higher-rated games the last two years have been the, the noon time slot. So they're now looking at the noon time slot, not the prime time t- slot, but the noon time slot as their big one. So that's why they're going to have their big pregame show with, uh, I want to say it's Rob Stone, Reggie Bush, Matt Leinert, and Urban Meyer heading into the big noon kickoff. That's what they want to do. Now, that means they're going to have to go head-to-head with ESPN. But they feel that their better ratings have been at noon. Well, the Pac-12 wants to be a part of the mix. And guess what? Fox has the Pac-12 contract. They may have a couple of 9 a.m. starts. 9 a.m. Oh. Now, again, does it matter to me? I mean, as a broadcast, I could care less. I've done I've done basketball games. I've done a bunch of them at 10 a.m. in my career. I could care less what time the game is, you know. I mean, when we did that game at Ireland, I wanted wasn't that game on at 8:30 in the morning? You betcha. Here? Yeah, that was an 8:30 yeah. kick. Yeah. All right. You know. Mm-hmm. And look, well, you got acclimated to be in Ireland. What? what? Yeah, you get acclimated. <laughs> it's there for four days. <laughs> it's like, come on. You know, yeah, I usually get acclimated easily anywhere, anyway. I, going Pacific time to East, whatever. I've never had a trouble adjusting. It's never been a problem. But the players, that means they're going to have to get up. Like, there is a clock that they want them to eat by. And usually that clock is somewhere in the three- to four-hour range, depending on the trainer. Well, that means that players, say it's, the, say it's three and a half hours. Let's compromise here. That means the players have to eat at 5.30 in the morning. (laughs) Just for TV. The problem that they complain about is that they get the late time slots. Now, here's the oddity of the late time slots. 
if there's a person that actually likes the late time slots in terms of being a viewer, it's me. <laughs> because if I'm on the road and we come back, that's the game I get to watch. <laughs> or if there's a late afternoon game here, that's the game I get to watch. Or a night game here. That's the game I get to watch. So actually, that's the one I enjoy because I get a chance. I've watched a lot of Washington State football the last few years, and I've liked it. Now, for the rest of the country, no. And something tells me they just they don't sit there. Larry Scott and the Pac-12, they don't sit there and say, you know, Steve Jones likes these late games. <laughs> I don't think they really. How can care we about cater to that. that East Coast crowd? Yeah. Well, again, 47% of the population is in the Eastern Time Zone. Only 16% of the population is in the West, you know. In the Pacific Time Zone, there's only 16% of the population. Despite the fact that you have Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco, Oakland, Portland, and Seattle, there's only 16% of the country's population in that time zone. The Pac-12 could really help itself out by being a better product on the field. I mean, they've got big problems. I mean, their 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 financial disadvantage is huge compared to the Big Ten and the SEC. And maybe now let's see what the ACC does with its network. But the tw- Pac-12's TV network just doesn't reach enough households. It's as simple as that. The structure of the deal. Time zones are a problem for them. Yeah, I get Pac-12 Network at my house on my cable system, but I don't get it in high definition. So that's a no. New, that's yeah, a, right, neither do I. Yeah, that's a deal breaker for me. That may sound, you know, upper crust on my part, but hey, we love it's our height. Pack. We love our height. Well, it's a, it's a Pac-12 Network. What do you want to sit there and watch Arizona softball? Come here, break. No, I'm just I saying. But if there's that one or two, you have those one or two games, whether being a football game or a um, you know a primo, even it could be ten or eleven on Thursday night basketball game that would be on big you know, on Pac-12 Network. I I would tune in. I'd give it a glimpse. Well, I remember that I finally it was a game I wanted to watch. Ooh, it had to be two years ago. Washington was playing. UCLA. So UCLA at the time had Lonzo Ball, and I had not seen Marco Fultz play for Washington. I hadn't seen him play. I thought, you know what? For the draft, I should at least watch him once or twice. I tune in the game. He was hurt that night, didn't play. I'm like, okay, that's it. Well, I'm done. <laughs> I gave it my shot. Uh, so they're trying to fix the problems of the Pac-12. Like the biggest problem with the Pac-12 is to me is the product. Pac-12 football's eh, okay. Remember when Penn State played Washington? I mean, I, did, I tried not to sound overconfident going into the game, but I kept watching the tape saying, really? Now, they'll do something different. They're going to take the championship game out of Levi's Stadium starting in next year. They're going to move it to Las Vegas. All right, that's a tree. Then, you know, the new Dome Stadium that the Raiders are going to have. And they've had the conference basketball tournament there now, what, past couple of years, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But their basketball product has also not been great. You know, Bill Walton is about as entertaining a color analyst as there is in all sports. And, by the way, when you sit there and listen to what he actually has to say, he's also a very good analyst. But part of the Bill Walton um, shtick... And I apologize for using that word. It's just the best word I could come up with at the moment. As he constantly refers to the Pac-12 as the Conference of Champions. Well, no offense, but most schools don't have water polo. I mean, they've got a lot of championships and a lot of sports that a lot of people go, all right, really? When it comes to the big stuff, basketball, football, no. No. I mean, the, the problem the Pac-12 has right now in both football and men's basketball is the product is no better than good. It's not great. It's no better than good. The value of franchises will try not to get into the value of digital media. 
Because, again, their motto is sometimes when you're doing nothing, you're doing something. Taking your calls at 800-795-9565. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motors studio, here's Steve Jones. Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Great to have you with us on this Thursday. Phillies have a big series with the Braves coming up. Blair Thomas, the former Nittany Lion great, who's actually going to be making an appearance at the Spikes game tomorrow night. In fact, for the first time ever, believe it or not, uh, he gets a bobblehead out of it. And uh, that's great news. So uh, we'll have him on the show. And then uh, Ben Jones from statecollege.com on Penn State football in the final half hour of the show today. So, we're going to talk about something that I always find to be fun. And that is the value of franchises. We'll talk about TV ratings and we'll talk about things like that along the way. But Kurt Badenhauser, the senior editor of Forbes, yes, we do read Forbes. It's maybe a sports show. We read Forbes. We also read the Wall Street Journal. I know it's a sports show. Kurt, welcome back. Great to have you with us. Uh, Thanks for having me on, Steve. Let's start with this. Uh, Let's establish how is value determined. Um, well, in theory, we're looking at what uh, someone's willing to pay for a team. Uh, you don't you don't have necessarily a lot of transactions in professional sports, uh, but we dig into the finances of each of these teams. So, how much money they're generating from TV deals and uh, their stadiums or arenas, and uh, from from tickets and sponsorships and uh, luxury suites and all concessions, all that stuff. Um, and then we look at really what what teams are paying. Uh, sports teams are typically valued on multiples of revenue uh, instead of profits um, because profits can can vary and swing pretty wildly from year to year. Uh, so, so, so that's the idea. We talk to a lot of bankers. We talk to the teams. We talk to leagues. Uh, what, kind of, what kind of deals are, are being put out there and what kind of investor interest there is. And so that, that's, that's the value we put on it. But Again, at the end of the day, it only takes one person, uh, whether you're selling your company, your house, a sports team. Uh, and we, we've seen, you know, some of the numbers we, we've put out. Sometimes they get blown out of the water, but uh, we've been doing this for 20 years, and I think we do a pretty good job uh, of, of capturing yeah. the marketplace. Yes, you do. Um, so let's get to the Dallas Cowboys. Obviously, the brand name, the brand is great. Uh, this is not going to be a debate about Jerry Jones, the general manager. This is going to be about <laughs> Jerry Jones, the owner, and also the marketer. What are the what are the savvy moves that he's made that's made his his franchise as valuable as it is in the number one spot at five billion? Sure, a much much easier conversation on Jerry the marketer <laughs> than Jerry the GM. Um, hard to argue with the success of Jerry Jones. Um, paid 150 million dollars for the team, now worth five billion dollars. Uh, and what what he's done, he's done a few things uh, that have helped both the NFL as a whole uh, and in particular the Cowboys. I mean, the, one of the landmark things is he did when he first came into the NFL um, was really open up sponsorships. Because at the time, the NFL really controlled all the inventory. Uh, teams were very limited in terms of the sponsorship deals they could cut because there was all sorts of conflicts with the NFL's uh, sponsorship deal. So Coca-Cola had a, a, a sponsorship deal with the NFL, so teams were prohibited uh, from, from doing deals with competitors. And Jerry came in and said, well, okay, that's fine. I'm just going to do a deal with Pepsi with my stadium. It's not with the Cowboys. It's with uh, – with our with uh, the Cowboys home and the NFL freaked out and um but but and sued him and he sued back and then they decided you know what we will start giving teams more uh sponsorship rights uh and, and so that 
totally transform um, sponsorships. Uh, and Jerry put his uh, sales guys out there, and now they generate uh, more than $150 million of revenue uh, from their sponsorships, uh, way ahead of anybody else. Uh, but he, he's got more boots on the ground trying to sell these things than any other team. Uh, the, the other thing that really uh, – uh, changed the dynamics from the finances of the Cowboys was the NFL's uh, shared merchandise revenue system where you yeah, go out and buy a jersey yeah. at uh, your local sporting goods shop and that gets chopped up 32 ways in terms of everybody gets a piece of it and Jerry said you know what I'm going to break free of this agreement we have. I'll continue to pay into the system based on what the Cowboys have historically done, but I'm going to go out and sell on my own. Uh, and that has been a bonanza uh, for Jerry because he generates um, you know, he, he saw that way as an incent- a way to incentivize uh, the team to go out and sell more uh, if he didn't have to share everything with uh, 31 other teams. And, and so he generates uh, a ton of money by selling Cowboy um cowboy merchandise uh, across the country two items i noticed on a consistent basis uh one was this that there were several nfl teams not all but several nfl teams that showed a zero percent change from last year again some not all i also noticed that some of the soccer teams actually saw a decrease why is it in those two cases why uh uh a handful of NFL teams saw no change in value, and why did a few of the soccer teams overseas show uh, a step back? Sure. Uh, good question. Uh, two different things going on here. One, uh, the, the soccer question is, is largely a currency issue. So the dollar is strengthened considerably, particularly against the, the pound, uh, right. the British pound with um, – uh, the UK uh, looking to leave um, the European Union. Uh, right, the, the value Brexit of the deal. pound is plummeted. Uh, yeah. So Manchester United was down 8%, went from the second most valuable team by our count uh, to six this year at $3.81 billion. Uh, still generating a ton of money, but when you translate that into dollars, uh, it doesn't stack up as well uh, with the value of the pound down so much. Um, and with with the NFL teams, it's really a good... <laughs> It's really a growth uh, story. NFL teams are still wildly popular, uh, average more than $100 million a year in profit. Um, but, but we saw it a little bit when, when uh, Tepper came in and bought the Carolina Panthers. Um, people aren't necessarily falling all over themselves to get into the NFL right now. Um, you know, with the, There's a couple of teams that have been on the market. The Tennessee Titans uh, have been trying to sell a big stake that hasn't gone anywhere. Um, the the, the investment Investor interest, um, again, you talk to bankers and like the NFL, generates lots of money. Uh, it's a good story. Um, but for, for one, it's the, the people coming in, largely uh, Americans, because it's not a global sport by any stretch. Uh, you compare that to the NBA, where investor interest is through the roof right now. Uh, people are clamoring to get into the league, but owners aren't looking to sell. Uh, and it's a global sport. So instead of being restricted to the, I'm not sure exactly what the number is, six, seven hundred billionaires that are in the uh, United States, you can open it up to the more than 2,000 uh, that are out there around the world. In fact, just so everyone understands, there was a point where the British pound in the past year and a half, I think, was worth like a dollar thirty-five, dollar thirty-six. Now it's a dollar twenty-four, and then the other part is I want to say the euro is about a dollar eleven, dollar twelve. So that's just to give everybody just a, a gauge as to as to how much it has actually dropped in a year and a half. Uh, yeah, the soccer teams are still really healthy. I mean, there's no oh, yeah. Barcelona oh, no. just reported no, their results. No almost a billion dollars, uh, excuse me, not a billion dollars, almost a billion euro uh, they just reported this week. Uh, so the, the the soccer teams, and they're really, they really serve as the model for the NBA teams where they can go into just about every market, uh, whether it's in Asia, Europe, South America, Africa, and go out and sell content. Uh, there, there's a really insatiable appetite for it. Uh, from a content standpoint, sponsorship standpoint, merchandise standpoint, uh, and so that's a that's a leg up that the NBA has over, say, the NFL and Major League Baseball. 
there was a point in 2012 where there was one team worth one franchise worth two billion. Now all 50 of your top 50 are two billion or better. Is there a topping out point for sports, or do you continue to see growth? Yeah, that's a good question, and we struggle with that. Uh, We're working on our NFL valuations right now, and particularly with the NFL, the way the NFL uh, ownership structure is set up, where you you know one partner has to uh, own at least thirty percent of the franchise. Uh, They've grandfathered in some of the teams, but but a new owner uh, has to put up uh, at least thirty percent equity uh, debt. Uh, the amount of money you're allowed to borrow to buy a team is very small. So w- once the value of these franchises start getting up to the point where it's three, three and a half, four billion dollars, the pool of people that are able to write, that have the cash on hand to write that check, uh, is really small. Um, so, so, you know, we do reach a point. Um, you know, if, if you don't have corporate ownership, there there is a certain limit in terms of how much people are going to pay. Uh, and we're, we're assuming that Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates are not <laughs> going to buy sports franchises. Yeah. Um, so, so once you get past that crop of um, people, um, you know, who, who, how many people are out there uh, that, that have that kind of liquidity uh, and mm-hmm. can go out and pay? Uh, we, we haven't hit, I don't think we've hit that point yet. Uh, Joe Sai just came in, um, the co founder of Alibaba, and paid, bought. 49% of the nets, and he's probably going to uh, exercise his right to buy the remaining 51% from Mikhail Prokhorov um, over the next few years. And so, so there are still people out there, um, but 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 based on the current ownership structure and the debt limits, if the NBA and the NFL were to turn around tomorrow and say you can go out and borrow. Seven hundred, eight hundred million dollars to buy one of these franchises because we're making mm-hmm. so much. Where our profits are so high, we can go around and it, that would be okay because you're going to be able to pay back that debt. You'd see uh, the value of these teams uh, soar even more uh, on the spot. Uh, but right now, if you can only borrow two hundred and fifty million dollars or three hundred million dollars, depending on what league we're talking about, um, that does uh, put put a, a ceiling on prices to some degree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you talk about some of the internet giants. For you. Steve Ballmer ended up buying the Clippers. He spent two billion. I think you had his valuation at two point two billion right now. And uh, the late Paul Allen, of course, had the Blazers and the Seahawks for a long period of time. So there've been uh, guys like that have shown some interest in owning sports franchises. I want to ask you about sure. one that, that the one that's interesting, and that's Jacksonville, the Jaguars. It's not it's not the greatest market on the planet. I've done the Gator Bowl, so I can tell you it's not the greatest stadium on the planet. But they do, but they do split and play obviously a game every year in London. Does the London part help their value in some ways, and does it help their merchandise in some ways because they play so often in England? Sure, uh, the value of Jacksonville is higher than than some of their contemporaries down there. They're they're ranked 49th. Um, just ahead of the Saints uh, and a couple of NFL teams that didn't make the cut, like uh, the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, and, and what's going on here is Jacksonville has a couple things going for it. Yes, that London component definitely helps uh, boost revenue for the franchise, uh, and they seem to be kind of locked into that. Jacksonville is also uh, has a portability uh, more so than other teams uh, that are that are down at that bottom tier of NFL teams. So. They could get out of their lease. Uh, a lot of these leases are relatively ironclad, where you have no chance to leave the city. I'm not saying Jacksonville is going to pick up and leave. Uh, the ja- sorry, the Jaguars are going to pick up and leave Jacksonville anytime soon. But they do have more flexibility to get out of their lease than a lot of those franchises do. So if another city is going to fall all over themselves to build uh, the Jacksonville Jaguars a new stadium and uh, uh, Shad Khan decides, you know what, maybe I should explore my options. Um, that is out there. And so that increased that, you know, we, what we saw the value of the Rams go yes. crazy 
When they yes. moved from St. Louis to Los Angeles, the value of the team doubled. Yeah. Uh, so is there a better market out there than Jacksonville that has more uh, corporate support? Maybe um, that, that's willing to build a, a publicly funded football stadium. Could that draw the Jaguars? Um, we'll see. But but that's the reason why uh, Jacksonville, uh, in addition to playing those games in London, which is more lucrative than playing in a game um, in Jacksonville, because and and it does help merchandise and and some other revenue areas. Uh, that, that's the reason that Jacksonville is ahead of some of those other uh, NFL franchises at the bottom. Now, we know what the value happened with the Rams going from St. Louis back to Los Angeles. What what about the Chargers? <laughs> I, I don't know how to oh, phrase that question. I don't, know, I, I don't know how to phrase that question any better, Kurt. <laughs> uh, um, the Chargers, um, you know, <laughs> this is the Rams stadium. I mean, the, the there shouldn't be any confusion. The Chargers That's are right. going to be a tenant. Uh, yes. They're going to pay rent. The Rams are going to collect basically all the revenue. Uh, the Chargers are playing in a, I don't know how many, they, what is it, see 28,000 fans with their, their temporary home, something yeah. like that right now. Yeah, uh, Carson, and, and yeah. All, the fan base is all coming to sh- watch other teams. Um, yes. I that seems like a miscalculation to me. I mean, the way this is all played out, uh, Los Angeles not necessarily clamoring for football, and suddenly they get two teams at the same time. Um, it, I don't think it's quite worked out as well as um, the NFL had hoped. Uh, but we, we've got the Chargers ranked uh, 41st at $2.28 billion flat over the last 12 months. Uh, a lot of uncertainty how this is all going to play out in terms of how much revenue they're going to be able to uh, get from being a tenant um, at, at Stan Kroenke's uh, new stadium for the Rams. Right. Um, so it's 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 an unsettled situation right now. On the plus side, they have a fantastic football team. They might go yeah, out and win the Super Bowl this year. Um, so, so that that you know can sometimes be a plus in terms of generating excitement. And uh, but but they're not going to control the revenue streams. So right. they're they're somewhat limited. Um, in, in terms of the upside for the franchise, the, going and partnering with uh, Stan Kroenke, uh, who owns the Rams and is funding this uh, state new stadium in Los Angeles, it was the safe play. They're going to be guaranteed a certain level of revenue each year. Expenses are going to be very low because the Rams are going to operate the stadium. Uh, so, so there's not a ton of upside uh, with the Chargers as, as long as they just serve as a tenant and don't control the revenue streams. And Kroenke is married to Ann Walton, which is a good backup plan. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one final question, just so everyone understands that, that the value of the franchise does not – do not sit there and say, well, they're a terrible team. How could they be that valuable? Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the New York basketball <laughs> Knickerbockers. <laughs> There you are. That's always the team that people bring to my attention. And any time we do this, those Nick fans go berserk. Um, they're ranked fifth overall. It's um, after a decade of awfulness on the court. Uh, but they, the NBA is booming right now. Uh, Dolan family sunk a billion dollars into their uh, Madison Square Garden company, uh, controlled by the Dolan, sunk a billion dollars into renovating uh, the arena Madison Square Garden, and that is a and it's literal it, ATM way. machine, how much money it yeah. produces, despite how bad the product is on the court. Yeah, uh, and I can tell you, after doing uh, the Big Ten tournament and the NIT last year, and they spent it well. Uh, the garden is fabulous. They did a great job. It's spectacular. It's spectacular. Yeah. I've seen sports there, concerts. It's, um, yeah. They did a great job. Uh, and so that's why people show up. You know, so you, whether you're showing up to watch the Knicks, you, you see, you know, the NBA, uh, you know, the stars only come to town, the stars in the Western Conference only come to town once a year. Um, yep. It's 41 games. It's a little more manageable than uh, a Major League Baseball schedule. Uh, so uh, despite how bad the team is, every night is kind of an event at Madison Square Garden uh, with the Knicks playing. And, and, the, and, and the great $64,000 question is, 
what if the team was good? I mean, I know, in, the, exactly. in the 1990s, when the early 90s, yeah. when the team was good, uh, the, 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 the before the Yankees took off, New York was a, a Knicks town. I mean, they Agreed. ran this town. Uh, they were the biggest show going. Um, but we, we, it's hard to remember those days because uh, it, it seems like a lifetime ago. Kurt, you always do great work anyway, but I always get really am intrigued by this article. Thanks so much for the time, the insight, and I look forward to catching up with you again shortly. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Steve. Kurt Badenhausen, senior writer, senior editor, senior editor at Forbes. Great stuff. All right. Next half hour, Blair Thomas will join us. Former Nittany Lion, great.